It's a great day for Gauss Binet. Thanks for joining us today. In this video, we're going to talk about cubicle complexes, uh, digital images, and how we can use the Gauss Binet theorem to compute the genus of a digital image in 3D. So, this is pretty cool because we're going the opposite direction than we normally do when we use the Gauss Binet theorem. We're going to compute local curvatures and use that to tell us. Uh, the genus of our surface. So pretty neat. Um, Murphy, do you want to be in the intro video? Here he is. Murph's ready for it. What do you think, Murph? Oh, he wants to kiss on the lips. All right. Great day for Gauss Binet. Let's dig in. It's a great day for Gauss Binet. We are up to video number nine. And it's December here in Bozeman, Montana. Last time, what did we do? So we explored curves on surfaces and we wanted to know if they were contractible or not. So for example, if we have a curve that looks something like this, I could contract that curve to a point, no problem. But if I had a curve that did something like this, it would get stuck around this sort of hole in my surface and we would say that's not contractible. Uh, so we used the gauss binet theorem to, to explore a linear time algorithm to determine whether a curve is contractible on a surface or not. And our, here our genus was greater than or equal to two. And yeah, so um, again, just given intuition here, it wasn't very rigorous, especially near the end. But if you wanna dig in, here's the paper, Erickson and Woodley. And as I mentioned in the video, there's a video lecture by Jeff Erickson on his website that you can get uh, more detail. So I um, thought about going back and filling in some gaps, but you can do that on your own. Feedback, uh, we're getting some likes here, but uh, no comments. I was hoping to have a section of this video in these videos where I address combat comments, but um, alas, I don't have any comments. So maybe please leave some. I'm looking like there's only gonna be another video or two. So I'd like to have a few comments before I end the series. It would be fun to address, but um, the likes are appreciated. So keep watching and liking. Okay, what are we gonna do in this video? We're gonna talk about cubicle complexes a little bit, and then we'll dig into this paper by Chen and Rong from 2010 called Digital Topological Method for Computing Genus and Betty Number. So I'll pause for a minute, I'll show a picture of the paper here. And one of the reasons I really wanted to include this video is that um, most of our examples of using the gauss binet theorem have been where um, we know the Euler characteristic and we use that to, to compute something about curvature at a, in some place and then compute this. Whereas here, we are trying to um, compute the genus. So remember the Euler characteristic um, is equal to two minus two G. So um, if we know the Euler characteristic, we know the genus in this case, because our um, surfaces are orientable. So here we're gonna know local curvature and we're gonna compute the genus. So nice um, example of how the gauss binet can be used in uh, two directions here. So the, um, that's one, one of the reasons I wanted to include this, this paper in the series. So be on the lookout for that. Okay, yeah, so cubical complexes, sometimes called digital images. So we've seen this before. If you have a black and white picture, um, for example, my smiley face here, what is it really? Well, we have a grid, and for each cell in our grid, we either color it black or white. So if we, um, you know, assign coordinates to these things, maybe this is what one, two, this is... This cell here is two, four. I'd say, well, two, four, color it black. And you can go through your grid and just say, which pixels are colored black here? So that's great. Um, I think we've all seen a black and white image. And so that's sort of a natural thing to work with. In 3D, sometimes we call these pixels voxels. I maybe will stick with calling them pixels. But instead of squares, same idea, we have, um, cubes here and so we can just if we want to know you know what our image looks like well we can iterate through our um, cube here and just say well which subcubes are colored black and which are not so that's interesting and uh, we'll call each one of these things a, a coordinate so this is a 
according you think of them as xyz if you like maybe i'll refer to them as that um, later in the video so we, uh, each point in our cube um, has a coordinate and we're going to tell it to color it black or white oh yeah sometimes it's useful to think about these uh, the dual of these things so you'll say well instead of saying which square we just specify the center and just say well is it colored black or white oh my picture looks a little bit demonic there there but that's okay in one application of these is you can think of a lot of medical imaging. So if we have a medical imaging of a heart and we want to know, well, um, what is the topology of this, this image we created? Uh, how many holes does our heart have? If it has too many, uh, that's a problem. And if it has not enough, that's also a problem. So I think um, we're motivated by uh, some medical imaging. Or lots of other imaging questions, but medical imaging is sort of nice, and the heart has interesting topology, but you could think of any body part um, uh, as well. You want to compute holes in it. So when dealing with these um, cubicle complex, there's this sort of interesting question of, are pixels neighbors? So for example, if we have this pixel here, is uh, this one a neighbor to it or not? And specifically, we could ask, should this form a closed curve? I think a case could be made um, on either side. In one case, well, there's sort of connections here, and you can sort of walk around and um, see that this is a closed curve. But on the other hand, we have sort of these gaps, so it's not clear um, whether these four pixels should make up a closed curve or not. So that's maybe the first thing we want to resolve here. And we can define um, different notions of neighbors, and that's going to be our ticket here, our ticket out. Um, so we say for pixels, two pixels are eight adjacent if they're distinct and each coordinate differs by at most one. So if we say this is a zero, zero here, uh, well, each coordinate around here that I've drawn, so this would be maybe one, one, well, they're, it's distinct and each coordinate differs by one. This is zero to one, this is zero to one, so it differs by one. And we can see why this is called eight ad adjacent as we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we could define neighbors as being, um, you're a neighbor if you're an uh, element of this eight adjacent set here. So we would say, in this case, if we're using eight adjacency, we would say these two are neighbors. But we could also say, you know, four adjacent if we differ in at most one coordinate. So these, um, if we're using four adjacency, we would say these things are not neighbors, whereas something like um, this would be one zero would be a neighbor to our point zero zero here. And we could see again, why is this called four adjacent? Well, we're having four neighbors in this case. In three space, you can do the same thing. Uh, so 26 adjacent, I'm not gonna count all these things, um, but uh, you could count them, there's 26 of them. And you could say, well, they're 26 adjacent if they're distinct and each coordinate differs by at most one. So um, let's maybe just verify for one coordinate here. So if this is zero, 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 uh, this would be what our one, one, one. So distinct and each coordinate differs by at most one. And you could go through and count that um, there are in fact 26 neighbors here. And then we could go down to so 18 adjacent, uh, 26 adjacent and differ in at most um, two coordinates. So this would be what, um, so uh, depending on what we call our axis here. So which one is the same? We'll say our Y is the same. So this is one, zero, one. So this one, here would be 18 adjacent, but not, yeah, it's 18 adjacent here. Yeah. And this one here is 26 adjacent, but not 18 adjacent. Okay, so that's what we're saying. And you could go down further to say six adjacent as well in three space. So how does this help us resolve this issue of whether this is a closed curve or not? Well, for one thing we can do is we can say, well, let's say that, um, eight adjacent for white and four adjacent for black. And then if we look at this, we'll say, well, if we're using four adjacent for our black pixels, then this thing is isolated. It has no black neighbors. And so we'd say, well, this should not be a closed curve then because we just have these isolated points. And if we use eight adjacent for white, then this agrees because this thing would not be surrounded because for example, we have these um, 
these white points out there as well. So we resolve this paradox of determining whether we have a Jordan curve by using different notions of adjacency for white and black. So that's sort of an interesting thing. So um, in 3D, yeah, we're going to look at um, 6 and 26 connectivity for this same reason. So if someone says, I have a digital picture, what are they talking about? Um, they're saying, well, we have um, a quadruple, and we're going to say we have some space that we're living in. For us, this will be R3. And then we want to define our adjacency rule so we don't run into this combinatorial topological paradox that I discussed above. And then we want to just find uh, what subset we're calling black here. So here's an example of a cubicle complex um, that sort of looks like uh, the torus here. But remember, these things are solid, so topologically that's interesting. Okay, so we resolved this cubical complex paradox. So let's get back to the paper. And the big idea is if you have one of these things, you can compute the curvature locally. So if I take this point, I can, you know, compute the discrete Gaussian curvature like we have in previous videos where you sum up um, 2 pi minus the angles incident to it. Um, and so we have different flavors. We can enumerate all possible... Um, vertices in our complex and uh, in the paper they define this based on the number of neighbors so this says one two three and this says one two three four and um, we can plug these things into our um, formula for discrete curvature and what do we notice if you have three neighbors using our formula here each one of these is pi over two so our curvature is positive pi over two that's pardon me for scrolling so we'd have positive curvature here for the fours, we'd have zero curvature, so that checks out. And then you can verify that for if we have five neighbors, our curvature is negative pi over two. And if we have six neighbors, our curvature is negative pi. And those are all the options that we have. So um, if we let mi be the number of points with i neighbors, we can use our gauss binet theorem. And we know this sum on the left, and we can use that to compute our genus uh, via this formula. And so we find our genus um, in terms of the number of points with each number of neighbors. So that's pretty cool. So nice application of the Gauss-Binet theorem. So yeah, so we get a linear time algorithm in the size of our um, cubicle uh, 3D cube image. You just scan all the points, um, count their neighbors, and then record these numbers and you can compute the genus from there. It's a nice application of the Gauss-Binet theorem. Oh yeah, the paper goes on to compute uh, the Betty numbers. Uh, I don't think I've talked about those in these videos, but uh, Betty zero, so these are the rank of the homology group. Uh, you can think of Betty zero as the connected components. Betty one is circular holes. Uh, Betty two, I don't know why I didn't write this, but voids. So the inside of a sphere, if you like. And then it uses, um, Alexander duality and sort of a nice way to compute um, Betty 2. So, but we can get Betty 1 using the Gauss-Binet theorem. So pretty cool. So summary, we talked about cubicle complexes in this video. We sort of have this, should this be um, a closed curve? It's not clear. And we resolve this by using different notions of adjacency for the white pixels and the black pixels. And then we looked at the paper of Chen and Rong, and we like this because um, it's sort of different than our other examples in that we're, we're going in this direction where we compute this and we're after the genus as opposed to most of our other applications where, you know, we had the disk, we had the sphere, and we wanted to compute something. So pretty cool there. All right, next time, uh, yeah, we're going to do the fundamental theorem of algebra. So I know some people are excited to see that. So tune in next time. It's a great day for Gaspinet. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, subscribe. We'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.